All right, you can turn in your Bible this morning to James chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 16. It's another one of the verses that's changed in the new versions. But it's an important thing here. Um, but while you're turning there, I just want to make a little announcement, another milestone here at Bible Believers Fellowship. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I was listening to the sermon about angels. Uh, this past week I was coming home from, from being at a friend's place. I was listening to it and I talked about how we had reached a thousand sermon downloads and how that that was great and everything. Well, this past week we went up over 50,000 sermon downloads. So the Lord's continuing to bless the ministry here and use it. And uh, it's quite an honor and a privilege to be able to speak to so many people. And I just want to thank everybody out there that has prayed for this ministry and supported this ministry. Thank you for that and uh, for all the nice emails and everything that we've gotten too. Appreciate that. But uh, we're going to look here at James chapter 5, verse 16. It says here, confess your faults one to another. Now, if you have a false Bible version, it'll say sins there. Sins and faults are not the same thing. All right, you got a Catholic Bible if you have anything but a King James Bible. It says here, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's what today's sermon is going to be on. Effectual, fervent prayer. And we're going to look at those five key words there. Effectual, fervent, or I'm sorry, not five, four key words. Effectual, fervent, righteous, and availeth. That's what we're going to look at. And you say, well, could you give us an example of what effectual, fervent prayer is like? We'll look at verse 17. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now that's very uh, interesting right there, because I, I believe, and we teach here at Bible Believers Fellowship, that the book of James is specifically written to a tribulation Jew. Okay, the time of Jacob's trouble, God starts to deal with the nation of Israel again. And you have to realize that. Okay, God was dealing with Elias there, which is your Greek, coming from Greek to English, Old Testament, his name was Elijah. Okay, it's the same thing, it's the same guy. But, you know, you have in the Old Testament, it's coming from Hebrew to English, here it's coming from Greek to English. So it's spelled a little bit differently. But it's talking about Elijah. Now, Elijah is not the same as a modern Christian today. In the sense of, you know, God actually chose him as a prophet that was performing signs and wonders to the Jewish people. But it's also kind of interesting there because Elijah, if you read back in the book of Revelation, he's one of the two witnesses that comes back, Moses and Elijah. And the neat thing about it is he deals with the nation of Israel in the future for how long? Three and a half years. What did we just read here? It rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? So back there in the Old Testament, he prayed to God that it wouldn't rain for a sign to correct the Jewish people. And for three and a half years, it didn't rain. That's a pretty good drought, by the way. <laughs> you know, we get kind of weirded out if we have a drought of three and a half months. Imagine three and a half years. You know, the cracks in the ground would probably be so big you could fall down into them. I mean, it'd be bad. But a very interesting thing there. So, But you have to be a little bit careful because, you know, rightly divide the word of truth. This is specifically written to Jews in the tribulation, I believe. But we can see the thing there of effectual fervent prayer. Availing much. Now, we'll start out here with the first one. What is effectual? What does the word effectual mean? Well, Webster's 1828 Dictionary says, Producing an effect, or the effect desired or intended, or having adequate power or force to produce the effect, the means employed were effectual. Turn back to chapter 4 there in James. <clears throat> I'm going to show you the thing here. What is the effect when you want to pray for something? What are you trying to ask God for is what's going on there. Is it, is your, are your prayers effectual? James chapter 4, verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? 
Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Very interesting there. If you read back through the Old Testament, through the history of the Jewish people, uh, verses 1 and 2 are very true. There's lusting, there's war all the time. They're fighting back and forth, back and forth. They're very warlike people. But that's different now, right? There's never any war in Israel. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. There's war all the time. I mean, you watch any kind of news coverage, you'll hear artillery going off, you'll hear bullets, you know, going and stuff. They just fight all the time over there. You know, very true. But you can use this as instruction in righteousness as a Christian. Uh, specifically there, the last part of verse 2, Yet ye have not, because ye ask not. And then verse 3, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Did you know that there are people that pray for things that are based on their own lusts? Lusts like covetousness? You know? Mm -hmm. How many people pray because they covet something? How many people really are trying to have an effectual prayer that would re, you know, basically go back to the Lord for His glory? You know, I mean, if if I mean, we pray that God blesses this ministry, and you know, I'm not going to say, you know, wow, God's blessed us with fifty thousand dollars or something. No, it's fifty thousand sermon downloads, and we don't get paid for that, by the way. So that glory goes to the Lord. You know, I'm not going to stand here and say it's my sheer talent and intelligence that's gotten us this many downloads, because it isn't. <laughs> you know, it's the Lord. The Lord is the one who's working through this ministry, and when the Lord says, okay, I'm done with that ministry, it's going to be done, and there's going to be nothing I can do to salvage it, if the Lord would say that. All right? Your prayers have to be according to the will of God. Don't pray contrary to the will of God to consume it upon your lusts. As it says here, turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to see a little bit more of this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 5, 5 through 8. Getting ahead of myself. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Another very interesting thing here. Uh, okay, it says here, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What is their reward that they receive? The praise of men. Oh, that guy, he's such a powerful prayer warrior. Oh, his prayers are so beautiful. They just touch your heart and everything. Oh, he's so wonderful. That's the praise of men. That's their reward. Down here on the earth, they get to look like a big shot and go around and everybody thinks the world of them. But in eternity... God says, oh, you're just a man pleaser. God's not impressed with that. Verse 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thy, thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. God knows what you need. Notice the little key word there in verse 8. Ye have need of. It isn't about your lusts that you want to, you're coveting money or things like that. Uh-uh. It's about your needs. And God knows what you need before you even ask him. You say, well, if he, if he knows what I need, why doesn't he just give it to me? Well, because part of the relationship between you and the Lord is that He wants to hear from you. Yes, He knows what you have need of, but He isn't just going to do everything for you. That's not how a relationship works. All right? Give you a couple examples here. How about some prayer once? Not needs, but once. You say, well, I'm going to pray to God and ask Him to, to make me a millionaire. Okay? Is that effectual? What is the effect of you becoming a millionaire? Do you think that God could use that? We're not going to turn there. I'll just read a couple verses here quick. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain 
For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Verse 9 says here, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. And then the famous 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. You know when you hear a Christian say, I pray to God for money and wealth. You know what you have? You have somebody who's praying after their own lusts, after their own wants. Because if all you got to do is just read the Bible and you'll see being just ridiculously wealthy here on this earth is not a good thing. All right, first of all, it's uncertain riches, like it goes on to talk about there in 1 Timothy 6. Uncertain riches because our, our money is a fiat currency. It's a, it's a fake thing. So it's, you know, it could be totally wiped out in no time at all. But even so, guess what happens when you become a millionaire? You make lots of new friends, you know, and they're not real friends. You know, there are people, there are stories I've heard of people that win the lottery or some kind of thing or they win some big game show and all of a sudden relatives that they never heard from are getting in contact with them, you know, and everybody's buddy-buddy with you because you have money. You know, and you go and you get your big house, your big mansion and your fancy car and everything else and you live like a nervous wreck. You drive away from your house and your fancy car and you say, oh, what? Oh, did, did you set the alarm? Oh, did you lock the doors? All of our riches. What if somebody steals in and, and steals our riches? You know, you drive and park your Lamborghini out in front of a shopping center or something like that. You have to park it way out and then you're, then you're worried about it and you set the alarm and all that other stuff. Why would you want to do that? It's a horrible life to be rich, to be ridiculously rich. And yet, how many people pray for that? What about another one? Make me famous and good looking. There are people that would like that. They like to be a, a celebrity. You know, is that effectual? James chapter 4, verse 4 says, Ye daughters and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You know what celebrities are in Hollywood? They're God's enemies. How would you like to be God's enemy? No, thank you. Luke chapter 16, verse 15 says, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Hmm. Not only are you the enemy of God, you're actually an abomination in God's sight when you are a celebrity. Now, you want to pray for that? You know, is that an effectual prayer? How about heal me and make me 100% healthy? That's another one people pray for. They want to be healed. That's probably the number one prayer from most people. They want to be healed. You know, they get sick. They lived a whole life of alcohol and cigarettes and whatever else. And then all of a sudden they get cancer or something. And they go, oh God, please, please heal me. Please take care of me. You know. What about that? Is that effectual? And, uh, you know, I'm speaking here mostly to a Christian with this thing here, with these verses I'm going to read. Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11 says, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. As a Christian, it is a 100% guarantee that you are going to suffer in this life. You can't get out of that. Now, are you going to pray against that? You know, these modern churches, their, their motto is, we want church to be fun. We want padded pews so you don't have to sit there and get a backache because of the old hard wooden pew. You know, we want... We want uh, to come as you are and dress as you want so you don't have to dress up or anything or be uncomfortable. You know, I mean, I, I actually had an older brother from the UK, you know, say about how he's disturbed by a lot of the house church preachers out there because, you know, they just wear T-shirts and they'll, they'll sit behind a, you know, they'll sit down or something while they're preaching and just, you know, sitting there drinking coffee or something while they're preaching. 
There needs to be some neglecting of the flesh when you come to worship with the saints. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the future. The thing of putting down your flesh, the war on the flesh. It's very important to put down your flesh once in a while. If you can't go for two or three hours without drinking coffee, something's wrong there. Okay, You don't have much control over your flesh. You're supposed to as a Christian. But uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7-10 through 10 says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Are you willing to go through that for the Lord? <clears throat> Are you willing to endure some infirmities? Sickness? How about reproaches? You want to have people make fun of you? People laugh at you, people mock you, people call you some crazy cult member or something like that. You want that? You're going to get it if you're a real Christian. How about necessities? Oh, I'm going to pray to God for riches so I won't have any necessities. Sorry, he's not going to answer that. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> God wants you to have some times when you need him. And that can only come if you have some necessities. How about persecutions? Yep. You're going to be reproached. You're going to be persecuted as a Christian. In distresses. You know, there are going to be times that you're going to have some really hard things ahead of you. And it's going to be quite distressing. You know, you're going to be tempted to worry. It's just part of the thing here. But it's kind of interesting because those three things there are something that all of us struggle with. But you have lost people. Those three things, money, fame, and good health. Those are the prayers that you're going to hear from lost people. Lost people, they'll pray for those things. All right? <clears throat> and it's interesting because those prayers, a lot of times they are not effectual. I mean, think you get some lost, miserable sinner out there and they get cancer because of a lifestyle of sin and they say, God, please heal me. Why? If God heals them and brings them back to full health, do you think that they're going to quit their former lifestyle? No. They're going to go right back to it. But yet, oh God, heal me. And then and God doesn't. They go, I can't believe in a God that wouldn't heal me. <laughs> yeah. They're not willing to pay for their life that they had. What about fervent? The Bible says about an effectual, or the effectual fervent prayer. What's fervent mean? Well, Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Hot boiling as a fervent summer, fervent blood. Definition number two, hot in temper, vehement. Um, <clears throat> they are fervent to dispute. Number three, ardent, very warm, earnest, excited, animated, glowing as fervent zeal, fervent piety, fervent in spirit. And then they have Romans chapter 12, which we're going to be going there soon. And I'm going to show you a good example of a man who was fervent. Acts chapter 18. Turn to Acts chapter 18. We're going to see a very fervent man. There are times when you can have prayer that is effectual. Something that, you know, the effect of that prayer is a good thing. You're praying according to Scripture. You know, you, you are doing what's right. You're asking for the right kind of things. But sometimes you're not going to be real fervent in your prayers. You know, you give God about 30 seconds before you go to bed at night. And then you fall asleep halfway through the prayer without even saying in Jesus' name, Amen. That's not real fervent, you know. Okay, so you can pray for things that are effectual, but the second part of it is fervent. Acts chapter 18, verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. 
And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now, was he fervent in his preaching? Yes. Was he right, even though he was fervent? No. And you know, there are a lot of Christians out there that are ignorant on the Bible version issue, on dispensationalism, on creation science, on a lot of the different important topics. And they might be very, very fervent. You know, they might be fervent for the things of the Lord, but if they're ignorant in some areas, what you do is you take them aside and you say, hey, let me show you the way of God more perfectly here. That new version that you're using, uh, that thing comes from a place called Alexandria, Egypt, which is interesting because Apollos came from Alexandria and he wasn't instructed in the way of the Lord correctly. Hmm, you know. You mean Alexandria, Egypt was not a, a center for Bible-believing Christians? Pretty much so. But here was a guy that was actually very fervent. And some of these new version people are very fervent. They're just ignorant on the issue of Bible versions. And you notice there Aquila and Priscilla, a husband and wife team. That can be a very powerful thing. Just because you get married doesn't mean that you have to quit serving the Lord. A husband and wife team took this man unto them and said, Okay, let me, let me tell you about some of the stuff here. Okay, that baptism of John stuff. Uh, something happened between now or be between then and now, you know, and they told him about Jesus and how he died on the cross. But the whole point is, what happened to Apollos? Did he say, well, that's just your opinion. I don't have to listen to that. No, he changed. And he actually went then and he began to preach Jesus Christ. The way that you can tell if somebody's genuinely saved is when you present the Bible version issue to them, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will lead them into all truth. And somebody who is genuinely saved and right with God, not a carnal Christian or whatever else you want to say, somebody like that will change when they hear the truth about the Bible version issue. They'll change. You know, it's what I did. I mean, I was presented with the facts. Hey, I got to change. I didn't say, well, no, I think I'm going to stay with my NIV. Uh-uh. I changed. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12. We'll go there next. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. We're going to see the thing about being fervent here again. Okay, Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Dissimulation is basically a Bible word for hypocrisy. Don't be a hypocrite in your love for other Christians. You know, if somebody says, we'd like to have you over or something like that, don't go, oh yeah, that'd be great, you know, when you don't really mean it, you know. Let love be without dissimulation. And look at this one. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Abhor that which is evil. Verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Hmm. Notice those are not suggestions. That's what the Lord is saying that you should be like. Go down through that list. You know, we could do a whole sermon just on that little list right there. Okay, that's that's some pretty strict requirements for Christians in those list in that list there. But you notice it said they're fervent in spirit. I'll give you a good example of being fervent. Have you ever worked, had a day when you had to work so hard that you didn't even have time to eat? No time for lunch break or anything like that. You just, man, I got to work. I got to get this thing done. I have a deadline. And you're just going as fast as you can, moving as quick as you can, try and get this work done. And you just skip your meals and everything. What is that? Well, that's being fervent. And in the Bible, it's called fasting. You know, there are some prayers that you will have that you encounter in your life when you're going to have to be so fervent with that prayer, you aren't going to have time to eat. That's what the purpose of prayer and fasting is. I'm going to show you an interesting passage here. Matthew chapter 17. On the subject of prayer and fasting. Matthew chapter 17, 
We're going to look at verse 14. Read an interesting story here. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 14. It says here, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Kind of like there with Elijah. Remember, he prayed that it wouldn't rain for the space of three and a half years, and God answered his prayer. Why? Well, because he had faith and because he prayed fervently. He had effectual, fervent prayer. But look at verse 21. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. There was a certain type of a devil, if you want to get the Greek word there, it would be demon. <clears throat> there was a certain type of devil that did not come out but by prayer and fasting. In other words, it took a little bit more than just saying, hey, get out of there in the name of Jesus. You know, There was a little bit more to this. And Jesus is telling them that. Now, if you use an NIV, <clears throat> I'm going <clears> to <throat> show you here. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 17 and verse 21. Okay, here we have verse 20 and verse 22. Matthew 17, 21 is not in your NIV. <clears throat> in any edition. You go back to the 1973, the first New Testament that came out, officially released in 1974, but <clears throat> you go back to that one, it's not in that one. And you go the whole way up here to the brand new 2011 NIV, the newest one, and which I'm holding right here, it's not in that one either. But it's interesting because you go back to the early NIV and it has a little... 21 and a little footnote and you go down and the whole verse would be there in the footnotes and that was a big argument with the original niv defenders they'd say well yeah the verse is taken out but it's in the footnotes well guess what these new versions are a slippery slope they get worse and worse and worse as time goes on and as a slippery slope the farther down the hill you get the faster you start to move <clears throat> here's the footnote in this 2011 niv 21. It says here, some manuscripts include here words similar to Mark 9.29. Hmm. So the old NIV argument of, well, it's the verse is in the footnotes, that's now gone. They took the verse out, completely out. And you give them a little bit more time, there won't even be a footnote in there. Isn't that interesting? The NIV is a satanic Bible version. Don't rely on it for the truth. And by the way, let me ask you a question. Here, remember what the, the passage is about? It's talking about a high-level de devil. I must said demon. Devil is the correct translation. We're talking about a high-level devil here that can't be cast out but by anything but by prayer and fasting. Now, who would inspire taking a verse like that out? Do you think the Holy Spirit came down and inspired the NIV translators to remove the only formula that could kick a high-level devil out? I don't think so. And by the way, I have a video about that where I show that the NIV translators in their book, the NIV, The Making of a Contemporary Translation, the one guy said that this is not true religion, it's magic. It's hocus-pocus, basically, is what the NIV translator said. Fasting is not real, true religion. It's trying to manipulate God. That's the mindset of the NIV translators. They are wicked, wicked men. <clears throat> Is there another way to neglect the flesh to pray fervently? We saw the thing about fasting. Is there another thing that you can do? 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 3. <clears throat> We're 
going to see here another thing dealing with what fervent prayer is about. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3. It says here, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Okay, talking about the relationship between a husband and wife. If you actually forsake that, and and go into prayer and fasting, sometimes you need to neglect the, the flesh like that. You can neglect it through through fasting and also through uh, relationships between a husband and wife. All right? So, yeah, there are times when you're going to have to have some fervent prayer if you want a, a certain prayer answered. And that means you're going to have to neglect the, fle the flesh. So you can have an effectual prayer, something that is right and in line with Scripture, a need that you have. But if you're not really fervent about it, if you're just kind of like, you know, like I said, giving the Lord 30 seconds before you go to bed, well, there's a good chance you're not going to get that prayer answered. You have to have effectual prayer. It has to be in line with Scripture. And you have to have fervent prayer. You have to pray about it. The Bible says about pray without ceasing. But what about the prayers of the righteous? What does the word righteous mean? According to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, there's two different definitions I'm going to read here. Uh, just, accordant to the divine law applied to persons, it denotes one who is holy in heart and observant of the divine commands in practice as a righteous man. Applied to things, it denotes consonant to the divine will or to, do, or to justice as a righteous act. It is used chiefly in theology and applied to God, to his testimonies, and to his saints. The righteous in scripture denote the servants of God, the saints. Definition number two, just, equitable, merited, and I thy righteous doom will bless. Okay, that's the definition there. So righteous is somebody who does right. Okay, John chapter 8 verse 47 says, He that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, the religious leaders of his day. Okay, John chapter 9 verse 31 says, Know ye not, or I'm sorry, now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. If you listen to last week's sermon on Bible ifs, that's one of the ones we read. If any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. You have to be righteous. Don't expect to have effectual, fervent prayer if you are living in sin. If you are doing sins and things and, and not living righteous before God, God's not going to hear you. God's not going to listen to you. First John chapter 4, verse 6 says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. And we read this verse the other week too. This is an important one. Another formula if you want to have answered prayer. First Peter chapter 3 verse 7. Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Husbands have to be very careful that they honor their wives. I didn't say submit to their wives, but I said honor their wives as the weaker vessel. You're not, you know, into marriage as just, okay, I'm just going to do my own thing now. You give up doing your own thing when you get married. You know, your single life is gone at that point. And you have to honor your wife as a Christian man if you want to be right with God, which is where the term righteous comes from. All right, a good godly marriage is one where both people work together. But uh, look at verse 8. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. 
knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. You know, a righteous man is not one that wants to get revenge on everybody that does him wrong or that crosses him. A righteous man is one that is very quick to forgive. Same thing applies to women too, by the way. You should be slow to remember, quick to forgive. All right. Well, I remember what you did, you know, 12 years ago on May the 8th at 2.30 in the afternoon. Well, not really a Christian virtue. Be, you should have a very poor memory when it comes to things that people have done to you that wronged you in the past. Be very quick to forgive. Okay, get yourself right before God. And if you've wronged somebody, as we read earlier at the beginning of the sermon, James chapter 5, verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. Right? That's what you're supposed to do. If you want God to answer your prayers, you're going to have to have effectual, pray according to the will of God, pray according to the word of God. You're going to have to pray fervently, even to the point of fasting and abstaining from other things. Okay, And you're also going to have to be righteous before God. What about the word availeth? Okay, Webster's 1828 Dictionary again. Two definitions here. To profit oneself, to turn to advantage, followed by the pronouns myself, thyself, himself, herself, ourselves, yourselves, themselves, with of being, or with of before the thing used as let him avail himself of his license. Definition number two. To assist or profit, to effect the object, or bring to a successful issue as what will skill avail us against numbers. Artifices will not avail the sinner in the day of judgment. Okay, so in other words, it's something that is profitable. So you have the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Profits a lot. As we read earlier, when you pray to God in secret, he will reward you openly. All right, so if you want to have God answer your prayers and be blessed by the Lord, you're going to have to have effectual, fervent prayer, and you're going to have to be righteous. And people say, well, why don't you get a life? Okay, I will. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. We're going to see the thing here about how a Christian can, quote, get a life. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, isn't that interesting? The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Well, I'm righteous, you know, and I'm, I'm good before God, but secretly I have some sin going on. But God doesn't see that. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's kind of like the Amish in this area. They have these little booths out in the field where they keep their phone. You know, like God doesn't know what's in that little booth over there, you know. I mean, the eyes of the Lord are in every place except for our phone booths. You know, if you're Amish, <laughs> you know, and I remember this one Amish uh, guy I met the one time and he had this huge, big computerized lathe and, you know, they're not supposed to have electric. And I'm kind of thinking, OK, you got a forty thousand dollar wood lathe here. How are you powering the thing, you know, by born and burning firewood or something? You know, no, of course not. He reaches down, he lifts up a board in, his, in the barn floor and there's the plug. And he goes, he looks up at me and smiles and says, don't tell the bishop. Plugs it in, turns on this big computerized lathe. You know, what's going on? Well, you know, secretly I have uh, electric. You know, we're not supposed to according to the church, but uh, as long as they don't know, it won't hurt them. Now that's kind of a silly little uh, thing there. Obviously, we kind of laugh at that and you know, ha, ha, ha. But how many of us do that with the Lord? Oh, I'm kind of doing this sin here, but you know, I don't think God notices. Yeah, he does. And if you want answered prayer, you're going to have to clean those areas up. You have to be righteous before God. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And His ears are open unto their prayers. Not the prayers of Christians that are struggling with sin and not giving up their sin. You have to have... There are certain conditions to your salvation, brethren, whether people like that or not. You don't have to work your way into heaven. You don't have to endure to the end to be saved. But... If you want to have a right relationship with God, if you want answered prayer, there are conditions to that. 
And one of them is, your prayers have to be effectual, they have to be fervent, and you need to be righteous. And then comes the availeth much. But if you don't have those first three three steps down, if you're praying contrary to the Word of God, if you're only giving the Lord a few seconds of your time during the day, and if you are living in sin, God's not going to answer your prayers. He's not going to waste His time on you. But it says there, the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, in context there, that could be saved people. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Mm -hmm. The Lord will chasten you if you are saved and you are living in sin. <clears throat> so, how's your life going right now? How are things going for you? Are there some things you need to get cleaned up to be more righteous in the sight of God? And, you know, I talk about suffering and things like that, and you will suffer. But there are times when the Lord can really bless you, too, in this life. You don't have to be totally miserable down here on this planet. But, uh, interesting, we read this earlier. I'm just going to hit it again. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Did you know that God, all that God really owes you, in life, and it really doesn't owe you anything, but you know all that you really, you know, should be blessed with is food and raiment. And the Bible says you should be content with food and raiment. Now, do you have more than food and raiment? Yeah, I don't know of any of my listeners listeners that are just reduced to food and raiment. Raiment being clothing, if you don't know what that means. All of us have a lot more than that. Well, then I guess we're very blessed by God. Yeah, but I'm not a millionaire and I'm not world famous and I'm not in perfect health. Okay. You know, praise God for your food and raiment. That's what the Bible says. And it's kind of interesting because those three prayers that I mentioned earlier, uh, big riches and things like that and fame and perfect health, that's what you get in eternity. Why is it the people want to fight for that down here? People get themselves sidetracked all right, First Thessalonians chapter five. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse sixteen. I'm going to show you some keys to answered prayer here. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse sixteen through twenty-three. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you do those things and if you live according to Scripture, you'll make it until the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whether at the rapture or if you go and you go home to be with the Lord before the rapture. But that should be your prayer. And, you know, that you would be presented blameless before the Lord Jesus Christ. That's going to take an effort on your part. Okay, I can't preach to you and force you into living a perfect life. I can't do that. That's up to you. And you're going to have to get some things cleaned up. Judge yourself. The Bible says if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. All right? Learn to judge yourself. Practice self-judgment. And if you have some prayers that you need to have answered, you better learn how to do effectual, fervent prayer. You better learn how to be righteous. Because if you don't, well, you're probably not going to have some answered prayers. So that's going to be it for this morning. We will close here with a word of prayer. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I uh, just want to thank you, Lord, for the uh, blessings and the fruit that has been borne by this ministry. Um, I pray for your continued protection and your continued guidance. Uh, I just pray, Lord, that we would not take the this ministry for granted and, and uh, use it 
for covetousness or lasciviousness or anything else, that, that we continue to seek to glorify you and your word and bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and also to a, an assurance of salvation through an understanding of, of your word, Lord, and, and to place your word, this King James Bible, for the English-speaking people, as the final authority, Lord, in all matters of faith and practice. And help the people out there to understand that, Lord, that it's not about Brian Denlinger, it's not about Jesse Dulesky, it's not about anybody here that's, that speaks at Bible Believers Fellowship. It's about you and your word. We are nothing without your word, Lord. And I just pray that as long as we could be used of you, Lord, I pray that you'd continue to use us for your glory. And I just uh, pray for all those people out there that they would take these things to heart, which were preached this morning, that we would have effectual, fervent prayer, and that we would be righteous. And that, Lord, that you would bless those people who are standing for your word, that it would avail very much to them when they are living right lives. And um, I guess I just ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.